testing. Do you see the little lines going? So today we'll do this quick lecture and then I'll show you how to analyze the images of your gels. And then we'll go image the gels and the two that haven't done it will do the whole experiment. And we're going to sit and watch them. Are you? Yeah. So I can go to the car park store while you guys watch them. Oh, I I do that too. You need to do that too? <laughs> Why not just use rock on it? Because I'm, I'm sure they don't have a part in stock. Rock on is online. It's yeah. online. They have everything. Yeah, I just wanted it today. I just, it's happened this morning, and it's my best. The coolant reservoir is broken. Oh, so. you need some duct tape. I got a plastic welder. I thought about doing that. But if I can go get, I'm not going to let, I mean, this is the main car. Oh. So right. It's not my Volvo. Okay. <laughs> so I'm right. saying if it was your Volvo, it's probably still running anyway. Yeah, it's the, it's the VW. So electrophoresis. So like you guys had mentioned, it's the movement of charged particles caused by an external electrical field. Iontophoresis applies to the migration of small ions, right? So, but we're not doing that mainly, right? We're, we're looking at large molecules. And what we did the other day in the lab is, is known as zonal electrophoresis. And it's commonly used in clinical applications, like for doing what we just did, separating the serum proteins. And it's where charged molecules migrate as zones, usually in a porous supporting medium, such as agarose gel film, after the sample is mixed with the buffer solution. So, can anybody tell me the difference between what we did and what you do in proteins with like a Western blot or page gel? Don't know what I have proteins. Yeah. Did you say something about how, like, Western blot, you're transferring? Yeah, for, for a Western blot, you transfer it to a membrane, but yeah, we didn't do that. But in a page gel, polyacrylamide, page SDS specifically is what I'm talking about. Polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis slash SDS. Do you remember how you treated the proteins before you ran them on the gel? Yeah, you denatured them. And you do that so you're actually separating by size. But what we're, what we're doing with the... Uh, Serum gel electrophoresis, they're not denatured, they're in their native state and they run in different zones, not basically due to size, but just basically due to the resistance to flow because of how they're folded and their charge. Whereas SDS page gels, you denature the gels, you coat them with that surfactant SDS or detergent. I always get the, the two terms confused. <laughs> But it coats the protein, gives them all basically the same shape with a charge density that's related to the size of the length of the molecule. So little difference on what we're doing. It's more native electrophoresis, what we did. And this is, you guys know what it looks like, right? You have an electrical field, external electrophile field generated by some power supply. You have a positive electrode and a negative electrode, the, the, the cations, will go towards the negative electrode, the, pos the, the anions will go towards the positive electrode. And this is where the confusion always lies in naming the electrodes, right? Because the positive electrode, what did you say in the lab the other day? Who was it? Cat's always a positive experience, right? So, but the positive electrode's called the anode because the anode, anode, anions go to it. So that, I, I would always get those confused in my head too. So the positive electrode is the anode, the negative electrode is the cathode. So, I have a question about that. Yes. Is that the positive, how come there's like anions all on the, net, on the anode? Well, because they're the anions. They, the, they have a negative charge and they're going to go to the positive electrode or the anode. Okay? So that's, don't get the naming of electrodes confused. Mm -hmm. 
Westboro Baptist Church died. I think and I think he's happy. I heard he was excommunicated from that church too, because he because he wanted to go softer. Yeah, because his granddaughters left the church because they didn't want to be bigots. Yeah, so. I thought he was excommunicated so his uh, medical bills wouldn't roll over the church because he was an employee. That's very likely too. The, that he's they're 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 scam artists for sure, huh? They are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind letting the world know I think they're a hate group. They're registered as a hate group, yeah. Yeah. So, remember not to get the anode and the cathode confused. The anode is where the anions migrate to. Cathode is the cations migrate to, so the anode's positively charged, okay? So. Have you, did, 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 you seen that, that sad cat diary video? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I have seen it. Yeah, yes, you should check it out sometime. It's funny. You should check it out right <laughs> Maybe after the lecture I'll put it on. That sounds like it's real. Because I don't know what YouTube's policy is about videos of people showing videos that are on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> So force is on the par particle. So the electrophoretic mobility, right, it's the, defined as the rate of migration in centimeters per second per unit field strength in volts per centimeter. So you, it can be defined like this, right? So your electrophoretic mobility is equal to Q divided by 6 pi R N. Or, well, that's not N. What's that, nu? That's not nu even. What is, what is it? Huh? Mu. Mu. Mu? Mu? Mu. Who knew? Because my sister is in bi mu. So she used to get really mad when I said bi mu. There would be jokes about your sister. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say it, it's not mu, it's mu. Like with M E W. Like they don't want to call them moose because they call them the moose. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I so there, there's a mistake here, though, right? Obviously. Yeah, I see it. What is it? It's <laughs> there. <laughs> huh? You don't see it? Yeah, R, R and this is, what is this? Tau? And this is R. So this should be an R, right? Um, ah. Why would it be an R? I don't know, for radius. Uh, the ionic radius? I thought that was, never mind. So, or what, what's the ionic radius? No, it's not. I don't remember words. I'm terrible with letters like that. Anyways, but you, you understand this? So, <clears throat> the electrophoretic mobility equals the net charge of the ion, right? Which is Q. You always see charge is Q. And R is going to be the ionic radius of the solute, right? So, the smaller the radius, the higher the mobility. The larger the radius, the, the lower the mobility, right? And same thing with the viscosity of the buffer solution in which the migration is occurring. So as you increase the viscosity, who knows what vi viscosity is? Viscous. Who? Huh? Like the thickness is not quite viscosity, but it's related to it. Was that just on your test? <laughs> so viscous is like the the the. It's related to the friction coefficient. It's it's the the it relates to the ability of a, of a fluid to flow, right? Really viscous solutions are really thick solutions. Really non-viscous solutions flow really easily. Glass is extremely viscous. Glass is extremely viscous liquid, right? <laughs> yeah, you've heard of that? The, like if you have really old glass that over a thousand years, it'll like... Well, not even that long. I mean, yeah. if you look at like the glass of St. Augustine and all, you can see like the ripples. In Wavy it. glass. Yeah. It's cool stuff. Okay. So that makes sense to you, right? And then the electric field 
force of the electric field is going to be equal to Q times V, where V is volts, right? That's basically the potential between the electrodes, right? Q is the charge, coulombs, second problem, and force is newtons or kilograms meters square, second square, meters per second square, right? So, huh? Who? I, force, everywhere else in the world uses newtons in America. It's kind of like GDB and miles per hour versus kilometer Yeah. Here. So th there's going to be, when, when you put the, put the, put the, ion in the electrical field, the force of the electrical field is going to be equal to the, 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 the potential difference between, which is going to be your volts that you're, you put the power supply up to. The other day we did what? 200 volts? 200, I think. Q is going to be the charge on that molecule. And so basically the number of charges and the electric field you have is going to do the force. So that's going to cause that particle to move, right? So that, it's going to accelerate based on this force until what happens? Until the force of resistance equals the force put on the, the ch that ch particle by the electrical field, right? And that force of resistance is going to increase as it increases speed, right? It's going to be the frictional coefficient, which will be changed by what? The medium you're separating in. So if you have a 1% agarose gel, it's going to have a different fric frictional coefficient than a 2% agarose gel, right? Which is going to have the higher frictional coefficient? 2%, huh? right? So things will run slower in the 2% gel. It's going to, you're going to have a more of a force of friction in the 2% gel as you increase versus a 1% gel. Easy to understand, but anyways, your particle is going to accelerate until these two forces are equal. And the frictional coefficient also is associated with the size of that molecule. So the larger size has a larger frictional coefficient, which will mean more frictional force per certain velocity. So that's how the different particles are going to be traveling at different speeds because they have different frictional coefficients based on their size or charge, or based on their size and different forces of put on them by that electrical field based on their charge. So when the electrical field's applied, the charge of the particle accelerate until the forces are equal, and the velocity obtained by a particle in a specific electrical field is determined by the charge and that frictional coefficient. Okay? So that's how it works separating things by charge. And this is your basic setup, and this is really, I think, a terrible setup. Did I show this to you the other day? Or? It's a bad figure anyways. You have a power supply and then this gel apparatus. This isn't from your book, but I don't know if your picture was any better. So ion movement or conductivity, right? So how do these solutions, why are they conductive when we're doing electrophoresis? Why is that water conductive? That's the solvent we're using, right? What is it in the water that makes the conductivity possible? Yeah, you have ions, so you, the buffer that you're using. For a, a DNA, it's tr what, tris, tris acetic acid EDTA. So that's, that's what, where you get the, 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 the conductivity, right? across that buffer. So as you decrease the concentration of ions, your conductivity will go down, right? Okay. So conductivity is the sum of the concentration of the effective mobilities of all the ions present. So those, the buffer solution you put in, they're small ions, so they, most of your current will be carried by those, right? And I should have defined, cur defined currents is basically the flow of electrons. What, what is current measured in? No, that's the resistance, which is related to the conductivity. It's like the opposite of the conductivity, right? So ohms is the resistance, which also we use ohms to what? Measure the purity of water. The more pure it is, the higher the resistance or the lower the conductivity. So that's why we put 
ions in electrophoretic buffers so, so you get good conductivity. So current's produced, it's proportional to the voltage applied and current is the flow of ions. And it's the sum of the concentration times the effective mobilities of all the ions present. So So the ion with increased effective mobility causes a larger fraction of current than an ion at the same concentration with a decreased effective mobility. So what does that tell you about the concentration of your buffer in the solution? So those are the small ions, right? They're going to have a higher effective mobility because they're small, their, their radius is really small, so they're, they're going to they're going to carry more, so if you have an equal concentration of, ion, of these small ions and the proteins or macromolecules that we're separating electrophoretically, they have a lower effective mobility, right? Because they're very large. They might have multiple charges, but they're really mar large, so they're going to, you know, have a higher force of resistance in whatever system we have them going through. So as you increase that buffer concentration, what do you think it does to the, 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 the how fast those ions, or the, the macromolecules will move? So has anybody ever tried to run a gel when somebody messed up making the, 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 the TAE? Yes. Yes? I've seen it happen. Yeah. The, I, didn't, I didn't run it, but I have seen it happen. Yeah, so what happens typically is they make that TAE too concentrated, so you get massive current. And the majority of that current are the small ions. That you're, you're 10 times concentrated with the small, the, the tris acetic acid, EDTA. That carries all the current, and your macromolecules don't really move very much at all. So you don't get much separation or movement of those macromolecules, because all your current is the small ions. So if, if you want to increase the mobility of those large molecules, you decrease the concentration of those small ions, basically, right? Why do you keep laughing at me? I'm laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, types of support media. So there's all kinds of different support media for electrophoresis. We can have some kind of solution, such as a sucrose density gradient, where you're pulling ions through a thick solution of sucrose, right? You can have insoluble material. Papers or sheets of plastic, particulate versus continuous or gels. And this is an example of how you make polyacrylamide gel. So you take acrylamide. Who knows what acrylamide is? I know it smells really rank. Does it? Well, you're not supposed to smell it. <laughs> that's not the stuff that you make the acrylamide. That, okay. That's not the acrylamide itself. That's the, the T, what's it? T-Med? Is that what it is? I know it's it smells like awful. fish. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That's the T-Med that's used to, to, to do the cross-linking reaction. So chromides, it's a neurotoxin. There's a guy at UF years ago who died mouth pipetting making his own polyacrylamide gels. That's why you don't pipette oh, that's right. mouth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... So you mix acrylamide with this bis acrylamide, and this is where you get the cross links formed, and then basically the ratio of these you add will make the different size holes in the polymer, and that whole gel itself is one big polymer. So, and then we know the agrose gels in, increase the concentration of agrose, slows the mobility down. So different types of support material. Why do you think you need support material? So what's going to happen when you put an electrical field on particles is they'll start to, to migrate and form a zone based on their electrophoretic mobility. But if you didn't have any type of support material, diffusion, you know, this is going to end up being denser than the solution around it, and they'll kind of fall and then diffuse away and then so the support material helps maintain these zones, basically. You don't get that lateral diffusion from the, because you'll create a dense area and then it'll 
want to fall in that solution and then it'll cause it to be stirred again and mix up. Does that make sense? So you need some sort of support material. So the goal of this is to separate the macromolecules into zones. Support media allows the free penetration of material to be separated while cutting off convection. And this is what I was talking about, the convection. That's so it cuts off the convection. Media does this by restricting the pore size. Electroosmosis is the effect of charged groups attached to the medium that cannot move. The solvent flows with the counter ions, right? So some of the do you understand what this means? You have electroosmosis. It's the effect of charge groups that are attached to the medium and cannot move. However, the solvent, you're going to have it like an opposite flow with counter ions, basically. Types of support media, paper and cellulose, that's what we did the other day. They're very thin and strong. You don't get as good a resolution, but you don't need as much sample either, so they're very sensitive. Starch and agar gels. Starch, you get much better resolution than agros or agar, but who, who here has ever made a starch gel? They're apparently really a pain in the butt to make, but they're really good resolution. Agros, everybody here has made one, right? They're pretty easy to make. And I've seen people in the lab mistakenly use agar to make their agros gel and run DNA, and it works just fine, too. So. Polyacrylamide gels, they're less frequently used in the clinic. Unless you're doing like Western blots, then you'll probably use one. But you'll, you'll, you'll do these in proteins class. Capillary, who's taking methods two? That sequencing machine uses the capillary electrophoresis. So that's how it separates your, your sequencing reaction. And we'll look at that in a minute too. Electroblotting, that's Western blotting. So where you take the proteins out of the polyacrylamide gel and attach them to a membrane. And then electrochromatography uses interactions between the analyte and the support material. So it's sort of like combining electrophoresis with chromatography. But the support material has some sort of interaction also. So it's not only the electric field that's separating, it's also the interaction with the support material, kind of like, you know, chromatography, right? You get it? So, zone electrophoresis produces zones of proteins, and this is what we're, we're going to, this is supposedly what we did with the serum, but we won't see this many fractions, right? Because ours isn't as high a resolution as this. You have albumin, AAT, AMG, PLB, HP, all of these get separated. Fibrinogen, well, you shouldn't see fibrinogen, right? And serum? Hopefully that. Plasma. Yeah, so plasma. This does say serum, though. And this was separated by a page. So, but as you see, they, they, they're natively folded proteins and then they're separated, you know, into zones. So this is zonal electrophoresis. And I'll show you how to analyze your gel here in a minute. So we can have enhanced resolution techniques and the, the one you hear a lot of is DISC or discontinuous buffer systems so that you have low conductivity behind the protein, higher conductivity in front of the protein which tends to stack proteins between the two solutions. So anytime you do a page gel, or not anytime, but a lot of times when you're doing a normal page SDS gel, there's a stacking gel on top of that separation gel. Okay, and I think I got more clear things here. You have different compositions causes discontinuities in the electrophoretic matrix giving the technique its name. So disc con con continuities and disc electrophoresis. So when the electrophoresis begins, all the proteins migrate easily through these large pole portion of the gel and stack upon the separation gel in a very thin zone. So it's a kind of way to already like get the proteins concentrated into simple little bands before they get separated. So they have low, the first part of the gel, the proteins will move fast stack onto each other and then they go to the separation. But the stacking gel improves the resolution and concentrates the protein components at the borders and then you get separation takes place in the bottom section with the retardation 
of some proteins caused by, by the, the sieve <coughs> phenomena. You guys heard of that sieve phenomena? <laughs> well, you know what a sieve is, right? Sieve, yeah. sieve, sieve. Everybody's on me about how I pronounce things. <laughs> well, that might tell you something. I told you before, I'm not good at words. Good <laughs> words, they difficult. Yes. So it's like, you know, you sieving sand at the beach when you were a kid to look for shells and whatnot. <laughs> so. So this is a figure, I think, from your book showing you the, the stacking gel. It stacks them all, and then they get separated on the, on the other. So you got low conductivity in the stacking gel. So your large ions will move faster, right? Because they're going to carry more of that current. And then in the other section, there's high conductivity, so the smaller ions carry more current. The larger molecules will do slower and separate better. Isoelectric focusing, can anybody tell me about this? What's the isoelectric point? The word, like, the word sounds familiar. Huh? The word sounds familiar? It's the point where everything is all bounced. What, what do you mean by everything? Huh? The, you're on the right track. Yeah, so the protein has zero charge. We know proteins are a mixture of bases and acids, so they're a mixture of positive and negative charges. Isoelectric point is the pH at which all the positive charges are equal to all the negative charges, so the net charge on that protein molecule is zero, right? So that's one way to separate a protein is via isoelectric focusing, but it requires that your separation material to have some sort of pH gradient. So you spot the proteins there, then you subject it to a high electrical field, and those proteins will migrate until they have no charge, and then there's no, they're not gonna migrate in that electrical field anymore. And you've done isoelectric focusing. They're gonna migrate to the pH at which they have that, their isoelectric point. So that's what this means. Proteins are amphoteric, means they have both positive and negative charges. Okay, and charges are affected by pH. Who, who knows how charges are affected by pH? It's basic chemistry, right? So at low pHs, there's a high concentration of hydrogen ions, and they will, you know, protonate bases or protonate the acids and leave the acids with no charge. At Low concentrations of hydrogen ions, t things tend to have a negative charges. Bases will be neutral because they won't have hydrogen ions coordinated with them. And then the bases themselves will give up their hydrogen ions and they'll tend to have, you know, or the acids themselves will give up those hydrogen ions and they'll have a negative charge. So. And capillary electrophoresis, this is what we do for sequencing, right? So you have a really thin capillary and the capillary is going to work to kind of retard the molecules but then you subject it to an electrical field itself. The really small molecules will fly through that capillary faster than the larger ones and then it's a really fast way to do electrophoresis and you'll get nice peaks at your detector. Or if you look at the sequencing, who can tell me how this works? Electrofibrin? Yeah. So each base, when you're sequencing in the reaction, each, dye, each base has a dideoxy nucleotide added to that mixture. That dideoxy nucleotide, you don't have that three prime hydroxy group for addition, but each dideoxy nucleotide is given a different color fluorophore added to it that'll fluoresce, you know, and that's gonna get added where that base is added and you'll be able to, and, and then you won't get extension beyond that so that length of peptide or not peptide nucleic acid you know if you get that particular color out that base is at that number you know at that, at that size basically yes 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 
And that's typically how it goes when you're sequencing. It starts out a mess, gets to a nice region, and then ends up a mess. Huh? So factors affecting mobilities of macromolecules. A lot of mic macromolecules have a lot of different charges on them, right? So a lot of counter ions may be associated with those. So, and that affects what's known as the zeta potential. Who knows what the zeta potential is? So if you look at this macromolecule, it has one, two, three, four, five, six negative charges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve positive charges. So that's it's positively charged by six, right? But the net effect in the electrical field isn't going to be plus six. Do you know why? Anybody know why? There's a little surface around that that'll carry counter ions with it, and those counter ions are going to stick with that macromolecule, which has the effect of the, the net zeta potential of that mac macromolecule is going to be less than the charge of it, if it, of it all by itself. The fact that it has these counter ions in this little ion atmosphere, water hydration, really close to that particle. So the net charge, so here we have 0, 0, plus 1, minus 1, plus 2, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. So plus 2 overall, right? Because of all those counter rounds that are going to be traveling. So the zeta potential is the, takes into account counter ions that are going to be permanently associated with that macromolecule basically. And that's the, the, the charge, the effective charge in that, in that field. Okay. Relaxation effect. Anybody know what that is? You don't need to be worried about it affecting your separation, but it's basically the flow of counter ions slows down the flow of your macromolecules. You get like this relaxation effect, but it's going to affect all of the macromolecules you want to separate equally, basically. So it doesn't affect your separation, but it slows down their mobility. And then the electrophoretic effect also. So clinical applications, specific protein electrophoresis, if we want to look for specific proteins like HIV antibodies or something like that, we can do a Western blot. First you separate with the page gel and then look at it with antibodies. Quantitative analysis of specific serum protein classes, we'll be doing that today. Hemoglobin subtypes, you can separate hemoglobin and they'll separate into different subtypes. That's one way that you can discriminate if you're still producing fetal hemoglobin or if you have sickle hemoglobin or any of the thalassemias. Did you, did you guys look at gels in your hematology classes? Oh, I should have put a picture of a gel on here. You just talked about it? I got good pictures I could show you, but I don't have them on this. I'm stupid. Should, huh? So you can identify monoclonal proteins in serum and urine. Lipoproteins and lipid classes, you can separate the same way we, we did with the serum, or a similar protocol anyways. Isozyme analysis, What's our, what are isozymes? Do you guys remember from biochem? <laughs> yeah, they're enzymes, but they're isozymes. So they're enzymes that perform the same reaction but they're, they're different. Like I think the, the one that they looked at is lactate dehydrogenase. They're, they're different. They have different subunits and they can be arranged in different quantities of the different subunits to make the different isozymes, right? So we'll talk more. There's a whole chapter on it in this book. Immunoelectrophoresis is good for qualitative analysis of of specific subclasses of immunoglobulins. Also, I'll show you some pictures of those in the next couple chapters. Same thing with Western blots. We'll confirm the presence of antibodies against HIV. And then Southern blots used to identify presence of DDNA or RNA sequences. So. 
And this is what hopefully will look like. Let me show you how to analyze those gels now, because that's the end of this lecture. But I want you to download and use image J, NIH image J. I'll put a link up to the ow, put a link on Canvas for you, but I haven't yet. But basically, let me do this so instead of extend displays, I'll duplicate the displays now. See how it looks. Oh, there we go. This is the way Brigida likes it. So I want you to get image J, and it's going to be, uh-oh. Uh, uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think I took out my USB that has the image on it I was going to use. Let me go get it. But image J, you can download. And then after you install it, it'll be here in your programs. And this is the little thing you click on. And it should open like that. Then you're going to come up here and do File, Open. And I think because I don't have the image on my stick, see Open Recent. Yeah, I need to go get my stick. Be right back. Terribly unorganized. Huh? pictures on there. I'm going to show them how to analyze. Yeah, so that may be how some of your gels look. Okay. This one here looks really nice, though. You can see nice clear bands that are zones, different zones, right? If we want, we can adjust the image to make it look even better. And you can do that with image J2. You go image and then adjust brightness and contrast. We, we can boost the contrast or decrease the contrast, right? But you can see clear, clear different zones, can you? Here's one. What do you guys think this one is? Huh? Albumin, right. And you can, on, on the little lab sheet, it tells you the different zones, right? So you have this on the next page. You have this, but don't expect everyone to look like this. Th these look really nice. Some of your gels might actually look like this. <laughs> but hopefully we'll have some gels that look similar to this that we can actually analyze. This is going to be un unanalyzable. So, but you can see there's albumin. The next one should be alpha 1, alpha 2, and then your beta, and then this will be your gamma. What are gamma globulins? They're your antibodies, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, so this is analysis is super easy, and I'll show you. So basically, you go here. You want to have this selected, the rectangular feature, and you're going to highlight each lane. So you're going to make a rectangle so that it goes around the lane. Okay. Go like that. And then we're going to go to Analyze, go down here to Gels, and then select the first lane. Or you can just press Control-1. But then you can see this, you get a little number one here. We're going to take the cursor, we're going to drag the whole box over to the next lane, like this. And you can be off a little bit like this. And watch what happens. We'll do Analyze again, Gels. Select next lane, and it, and it identifies the next lane right there. So then we're going to analyze the, the, the dense, dense, density of each one of these lanes, basically. And this is called, anybody know what this is called? Densitometry? Never heard of that? So it's basically we're analyzing how dense this is stained for each one of those zones. Okay. 
So then we're going to go here to analyze again. We could have just pressed control 2 to make that 2 there once we had the box there. Gels, and then we're going to plot the lanes. And we get these, right? And that looks similar to what we just saw at that last image of, of the PowerPoint, right? So what do you think all of these peaks represent? Yeah, these peaks represent these different stain sections and how darkly stained they are. Okay, but we also have a, lot, a big background underneath. So what you want to do is you want to separate each of the individual peaks. So you're going to pick up this line. It already auto-selected the line. And we're going to basically take it from about here, make a straight line across to cut out all the background. And something like that. And then we're going to make lines, vertical lines, separating each peak, right? And these might not be perfectly vertical, but that's OK. So we have here, this is going to be the albumin, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and then the gamma, right? Now we just measure the area under each one of those curves. So you get out your ruler. No, just joking. You get out this magic wand. And you just hit the magic wand under each curve. Boom. And see, we get the area. Boom, boom, boom. And then that. And those are all the areas. So the next thing we want to do is open Excel. Let me make a new sheet. And just paste those numbers into Excel. Ah, what the heck? <laughs> Where was I? So we want the numbers. I never highlighted these numbers, did I? So we just highlight these numbers, go to edit, copy. And then we're going to paste the numbers into Excel. And we got those. Here's zones. This is the protein. And this is going to be the albumin. Alpha 1, alpha 2. Ah, what did I do? beta and gamma. Basically what we want to do first is sum the areas, right? So we go here and we insert the sum and then highlight these. Hit OK. This is the area. And then we want the fraction of area. Down here is the sum. Okay. This is the sum of all the areas okay. of all the proteins, right? I saw I, I just avoided wrong spot. Like, uh, <laughs> Next, we just want to do the fractions, right? So we know what fraction of each component is there. So how do we do that? Do you have a how-to online? No. That's what I'm making. This will be online. You're recording it still, right? Oh, that's true. <laughs> and then I'm making a PowerPoint of how to also. So I, that's what the, that's why when I pasted the screenshot showed up. That was the screenshot I most recently made. Okay. So fraction. How are we going to do the fractions? Right. We're going to do the equal sign and then highlight this. Right. And then divide by what? The sum. But we can't just do that, right? Because what happens when we do this? Well, oh, it, it doesn't make sense. So what do we got to do? Dollar signs. Oh, and I got it in the wrong spot. Dollar sign, which freezes the D as D, and dollar sign freezes the 10 as 10. OK? And now we can drag that and it'll copy towards everybody. Although we don't need the last one there, do we? Okay? So th these are all the fractions. 
But what else did we do in the lab with the serum? We may measured the protein concentration in those samples. So if we know that protein concentration, and let's say for, it was 7.5 grams per deciliter, or, is that right? Yeah. 7.5. That was in the reference range. So let's say that's what we got for the protein concentration. Here we're going to do concentration of the fraction. Okay? So we do equals this, and then we're going to times it by total protein concentration. And that gives us the albumin concentration in deciliter or grams per deciliter. And then again, we have to put the dollar signs to freeze the total protein concentration. So where do you put the dollar signs exactly? So we're putting the dollar sign in, in before the E and before the number of this one. Okay. And then that freezes it for that. But we can just drag this and it'll copy what we're multiplying. So the next one will be multiplying this times this to get this and so forth down the line. So once we drag this, this will give us our, all the other fraction concentrations. And if you look on the lab again, it has the reference ranges for all of these fractions. So your albumin should be between 3.6 and 4.9 grams per deciliter. And this is within that reference range. Alpha 1 should be 1, I mean 0.11 to 0.35, that's within the reference range. Alpha 2 should be 0.65 to 1 point, and they're all within the reference range, except for the beta, that's a little bit high. And then the gamma is, is a little, is, is good too. So they're all within, within the reference ranges. But you can look, if something's outside of the reference range, you can get an idea of what, what might be the problem. There, you could have chronic inflammation if you have excess gamma and so forth. So that's what we'll be doing in the lab. So measuring the, the, the different protein concentrations. Does that make sense? So you actually get quantitation of each one of these fractions by knowing the total protein concentration and the areas under these peaks via that, you know, densitometry. Good? So what we can do now is two of you can start the lab and the rest of y'all we can take pictures and take, take them off the stick. Huh? How long does it take? About an hour or two? Yeah. Yeah, they were slow. You might be able to do it faster. Oh, we could do that, but I'll, I'll shut the volume off now.